sorry. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, I hope you survived lunch and post-lunch kind of sleepness. Um, you had coffee, hopefully. To today and the next half hour-ish, I want to share you with you uh, what I learned about domain modeling, um, something that I actually looked into a lot in last year and I tried to experiment as much as possible in my pet projects and my um, job, like day-by-day -day job, uh, pitching stuff, trying to convince people, persuade people. And the easiest uh, way to learn and teach is actually doing, because you know, if you cannot do, you teach. So uh, here I am. Let's say if we have the technology to use a clicker. Oh, this is fun. Cool. Um, so this is where we start. This is something that it's pretty common. Uh, it's a DTO. It's something that comes from the back end. The back end people just throw a JSON at us. We parse it as best as possible. Everything is nullable because, well, I don't trust back end people. Um, so let's assume that everything is nullable, so JSON is happy, if you're using other stuff, let, let, everything is nullable. And first name, last name, it's a profile, kind of works. But then you start thinking about, okay, but really, I talk to the backend people, first name and last name are not null, so let's try to, to improve. And then we go with something that on our domain looks like this. Okay, we moved away from the DTO and we jumped in our domain. Uh, as a user profile, cannot be uh, null. First name cannot be null, last name cannot be null. So this is our first step in uh, building better types. The backend sends whatever they want. In our domain, I assume that they are at least not null. Being not null means that I can do Something like this, yay. Kind of working in Kotlin, in Java, and Scala, uh, it doesn't work in my domain because, well, I can't have an empty first name or an empty last name. So a string, it's not a first name. So th the whole thing doesn't work anymore, okay? String as a type, as a primitive, um, doesn't bring the constraints that we need in our domain, okay? We need at least... Um, non-empty string, non-white space string, so I don't want people starting putting tabs or new lines as their name, so we, we need something a bit better. String is kinda not working. Uh, first thing that I tried were uh, type alias. So I was like, okay, Gotlin has this thing, I can declare a first name type and say that it's, it's a string, so you can't actually build a user profile um, with a string, uh, kind of not true, because type aliases are actually aliases, so the thing looks like a first name, but in the end is still a string. So I can still build um, pretty much syntax okay, domain not okay, user profile. Uh, second thing that I tried were uh, inline classes, okay? Things are getting a bit fancier. Uh, but this is the, um, the new thing in Kotlin when you can wrap uh, primitive type with actually a type, so a real type. So you have a first name class and inside you can put a string. So you can actually build the user profile passing um, empty string. What you can do is actually creating an inline class that contains an empty string and then you pass the thing. So still, still there, still not working. Um, what we need are uh, better types. So you need actually to put some uh, thinking into how you build the type itself. And the first step was, okay, constructor, no, no bueno. So even if I create a first name, I want to um, make it difficult to create a bad first name object. And well, you start with a private constructor and then, then you work your way out. And the, the way that I tried um, was actually a so-called smart constructor or whatever is basically a factory. Um, and this is, was okay. this is okay. So I pass a string. There is a of, if you were in the DSL um, talk a few couple of hours ago, of is kind of borderline um, convention, okay, but well, if, when you start using it, it reads better than it looks. 
And that's how, what you do. You start with some sort of validation of the name. This is kept super simple, so there is no, no fancy stuff. We just check if it's not empty. If it's okay, I give you back a first name. If it's not okay, I give you a null back. Okay, kind of works. We can do the same thing with last name, getting oh, somewhere at least. And, and this is where we are. Basically, this is how we use it. And it's okay-ish, but now the, I mean, f working with this ish, because now you need to start checking for nulls, and works syntax-wise, okay, um, readability-wise, probably meh. I mean, if you ask me, the whole thing kinda doesn't work for me. Um, but we have Kotlin, so we can use other things because you can do the the different null check. So we basically now we don't have not null anymore. We have nested not nulls. So great way to go, Kotlin uh, readability just went out the window. So we we need we need to we need to go back to the the actual problem. Okay. So we if we use it like this our code base starts being polluted by, uh, with two different types. Because first name and nullable first name, they are literally, literally two things, okay? But in my domain, I just want first name. So I don't need the nullable one. And I, f and I don't want to check if the thing is always nullable. So I want to be able to represent the first name is there or there is nothing. And nullable is not the thing that, that does that. You know, the, the representation of um, the absence of something in a safe way. And then you start looking at how other people, uh, how other languages are doing it. Well, and then you end up with something like option, that it's the de facto data type for um, representing the absence of a value. Um, Java has it, the Scala has it, in Kotlin we have it uh, through the arrow library, you just throw a couple of uh, dependencies in your Gradle file. I'm doing Android, so Gradle file is what I basically do every day, um, but I think it's the same if you're doing backend actually with Kotlin. And this is how you use it, okay, we, we do the same thing, smart constructor, but now the, the smart constructor doesn't um, return a null, but actually the type is, is a different type. It's, it's option of something, option of T. And option is basically, it's a box. You can imagine it as a wrapper container, as they call it. It's a box. Either contain, uh, contains a first name or the box is empty. That's it. There is no weird things that you need to check. Either you get what you want or the box is empty. Like real world stuff, okay? It's no Schrodinger cat or whatever, live dead. No, either the cat is there or the box is empty. We, we don't like weird stuff. And w like something that you're already familiar with, um, with Kotlin, uh, like list also option as uh, familiar methods like map. And that's why how you access the, um, the first name in the box. Basically you can use map and you pass, basically you get a block and in that block, you you get a name and the name is there. So this is this is um, success positive biased. So if the, uh, the first name is there, you get it. Um, if you also want to be aware of when the name is not there, you can use fold. Fold is basically something that still you see in lists, so it's pretty familiar as a um, as a name. And and this is how you use it basically. You try to build the first name, and then you fold. You get two blocks. In the first block, it's when the name is bad or the empty, the box is empty. And well, the other case is success case. You get the you get the the name, and you can expand it to other um, fields. In this case, we do the same thing with the last name. So you create uh, the the same constructor, and this is how you use it. So. This is a binding is a um, so-called comprehension. It's basically a block where the options are evaluated and the last line in this example 
will always be successful from a uh, name and last name point of view. Basically, this is the super, super, super happy path. It, can get, it cannot get happier than this. And this is how you basically access the, the two value in a binding um, context. There are two ways. Either you append bind, or you use the, the structured um, syntax for variables in Kotlin, and you basically just do the parentheses, uh, and, and you don't do the, the bind. And here, you are sure that name and last name are, um, are there. And if you push it to a return value, you can actually build a user profile passing the, the two things. I mean, we are not passing anything, but you get the, the, the gist. So you, everything is um, happy path or empty box. And this is what happens in real life. If you try to get a passport, if everything is OK, they give you a passport. If something is missing, you don't get anything. You, you don't get a um, nullable passport. Or, OK, there is no. So either everything is OK, and you get a user profile, or you don't get anything, empty box. I mean, it would be weird that you, they ship you an empty envelope, but you know, that's the idea with a passport. And, and we are happy, life goes on, and new sprint, new requirement. Now we have also an email field. They start throwing stuff, backend people send us stuff. Well, I say backend people because I, you, I do Android. How many backend and developers are in this room? This is going to be fun. Um, backend, backend, Java, Kotlin, Scala, Java? OK. Kotlin, anybody? OK. Scala? Whoa. OK. I didn't see that coming. Cool. Um, email, nullable, because still, I'm sorry. Don't trust you. Um, I also get a, a fancy send email because we are working in a multi-team kind of structure. So I have other people that build libraries SDK for me. And they give me also the send email because now we have an um, email thing in the code base. And this is how you use it. So first thing that you do, you send an, e an empty email address, right? This is the first thing that you do. What happens if I send an email? Oh, who knows, right? But this is not working from a domain point of view because, well, an email is not an empty string. And by the way, a string is not an email. Same, same thing. It's even worse than the first name because, well, you know, you can always validate an email. And how you validate an email, you search for the thing on Stack Overflow because, I mean, seriously, who does that? Um, so. You build a, um, a smart constructor to give you back a e an email. Okay, it's an it's a valid email address or it's nothing. Um, it's different than a, an existing email address because, well, I mean, the only way that you you can actually say, okay, the thing exists, this is sending an email. That's that's how you do it. But at least from a syntax point of view, you know that it's a valid email, even at whatever.com. Cool, and you send it and bounce back. Still cool, we don't know. But now you, you start getting more types in your, um, in your domain. So the moment you get a first name, you know that you can print it. So you don't get weird stuff like you, know, you print something, you bind it on, uh, on, on your web page, and the name is not there, and you start debugging, and you realize that it was an empty string. Or for an email, you try to send it, and it, it's just an invalid email. So things are getting better. But then you have product people, because this pe they, I mean, these people don't sleep. At some point, they realize that we need to verify the, the email address, OK? Because I mean, we are not savages. And the, how we, we verify, we don't know. Still, we get a uh, Boolean to understand if it's verified or not. Uh, the never resting other team, they also give us a couple of new functions. Um, they are super simple. Send an email uh, verification and send a set. And this is how they still accept the string because, I mean, I'm, no, no, I'm not responsible for the other team. They look like a bunch of savages, but uh, I'm pitching domain modeling, so you know, you never know. Probably next sprint they can come up with something that decent. Um, 
We use it like this. If the user has an email or verified, send an email. And if it's not verified, send a reset password. Yes, you are right, my friend. That was wrong. Okay, and this is how error prone is the thing. Because, you know, Booleans, they are hard. Especially if you have a nullable Boolean, it's even harder. The, the infamous Mario, the infamous tri-state tri Boolean. Uh, I mean, if you just think about it, that it's just uh, whatever. So they are hard, and they, they, they don't work. So we try to, to improve, but still the Boolean is weird because the Boolean actually is trying to fix, up, to solve a problem that we, we don't want to face, okay? The real problem is that we want to represent two different things with one thing. Okay, we have two different things in our domain. You have an unverified email and a verified email. An unverified email is something that you can actually send a verification email. Okay, smooth. Everybody can understand that. And a verified email is something that you know the marketing team they can send surveys. Uh, you can send a reset password. Um, you, you can do customer support because you can reach the people. So. Those are two entities that are completely different, but we are, you know, we are trying to represent them with something that is, okay, it's an email, okay? We validate the address, and then you have this weird satellite Boolean going around, okay? Uh, try to, okay, and then you, then you need to keep everything in sync, okay? Because what happens if you change the email? Well, you need to reset the Boolean, right? Because you need to verify the email again, okay? And now everyone has to know. Everybody that joins your team, everyone has to know, check if the Boolean is true. If you change, put it to false. If you reset, and then and you basically added um, it, it accidental complexity to your code base. Everyone has to remember too many stuff. And you know, we are not built to, to, to think like that. We are not built, well, we are not meant to, to remember stuff. Plus, the onboarding process is longer and longer because the, the worse you get with this stuff, the, the longer it will take to, to, to help people. And, you know, when you start thinking about verified, reset password, this is easy stuff. A few months ago, 7-Eleven, the chain, like a multinational chain, kind of, uh, in Japan, they released a new update for the app where you you could reset your password, okay? Like normal, they, they had a normal form, you can log in, you can register, and you can reset your password. But at some point, someone probably from the product, because now we are back-end mobile, so I'm, I'm, take, I'm picking on the other side. So product people, they decided, okay, people don't, don't remember their password, okay? They will put the name, put the email, and get the password reset. What if they forgot their email? Okay, so they, they can also put the email. And they build it. And they were like, okay, so basically I can put your name, put my email, and reset your account. And they send the new password to me. Okay, so they, they thought about that a bit. And I was like, okay, no, 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 no. We, we are going to improve the thing because you also will need the the birth date, okay? So it's name, email, and date of birth. Cool, so it's, it's difficult because I need to check Facebook to get your, your <laughs> birthday, but they, they felt safe. And it, it could probably, I know, it, they, they thought it was okay. Until somebody was like, okay, but you know, date of birth, we need it, so it cannot be null, but we don't want to think about what happens if it's null. So we're going to default to January the 1st, 1970. And well, somebody actually got it. And this person built a script that started asking for password resets that had the default date as a birth date. And they stole half a million dollars in eight hours before they realized that something was wrong because people were starting, okay, I see, I see charges on my credit card, what's happening? And they were like, well, 
Did you ask for a reset, password reset? No? Okay, but we see, yeah. And they shut down the whole thing. So, you know, defaults, nullable, weird emails, just check stuff and can save you a lot of money. So, verified email, send reset password, unverified email, send just the verification email. And that's what we should do, okay? This is it, you know, an unverified email, it's something that contains a valid email address, done, you can build it. Um, a verified email is something a bit different because a verified email, well, let's say, just a sneak peek on the precise, uh, how, how we want to, the user profile to look. So we have first name, last name, and the email that can now be bought, okay? You can be like a choice kind of thing. And in Kotlin, we have a, like a, a sealed class for this. And uh, in Java 8, I don't know, how would you do that? Like a, not an enum because they will be like types. So, but probably you have choice type. I'm not familiar with the latest version because on Android, we, we switched a few years ago. But that's the idea. So the idea is that um, you have a verifiable email that we build as a choice type between uh, a possible unverified email and a verified email. And this is how we basically build the, the type. So the unverified email, you just pass an email and you get an unverified email because that's the default state, okay? Every email basically is an unverified email. A verified email is something that has to go through a verification process. So the way you can do it in a very naive way, if we don't think about network and stuff, well, you have a verify function, there is a verification service, and you pass an unverified email. If everything goes right, you get back a verified email, okay? And this is the only way that you can actually get back uh, a verified email, okay? You need to go through a verification process. And everything is in the type. So you're basically building the business logic in the, in the type system itself. And we can improve also the two methods that we got from our colleagues. Um, and now we have a safe version because, you know, the verification email, you, can, you need to pass an unverified email. There is no way around. And the password reset, well, I need a verified password and a verified email for that. And this is, you know, this is getting, um, this is getting better, better and better. Uh, but now the, the problem is that we don't know much from the signature because this looks like a um, kind of fire and forget kind of thing. We, we assume that there is a network request behind. You don't know for sure. Um, you don't know what happens if, if you start sending stuff. What are, there are errors. Does it, does it blow up? And the only thing that we can do is we, we start sending stuff, okay? And we, we investigate. We use the, the thing because there is no documentation, no source code. We cannot look into anything. Um, we cannot talk to the other people because reasons. So we are, it's like, like a lonely journey through reverse engineering something that you don't have source code. And you start just sending stuff, okay? What if I put a valid email? Well, I get something in my Gmail inbox, cool, the happy path, I get an email. Um, if I don't have internet, the thing blows up, IO exception. If the, my connection is low, I get back a timeout exception. If the email does not exist, well, that was the case, I get an email address exception. This is nice, at least they took time to wrap the, the server error in, a, in an object. But now we have a new problem because basically the method that we want to, to call gives us well, way more than one possible return type. So we have a, a, a success. We can model the success with a email sent because, well, nothing happened. We don't really have anything to give you. So I, at least I give you, okay, we took care of this. No errors, at least. And on the wrong side, we can create a silk class that actually models the two, three possible errors. And this is okay, okay, we have so many types, but how we do it? Because still, it's like a success or a failure. We can use something that models um, two different results in one single type. And uh, the functional word gives us either. 
And the way it works is that you have a type on the left and a type on the right. This is how basically we use it. The signature will look like that. Either you get an email not sent or you get an email sent. And the convention um, is basically, this is a naive implementation of how we can do it. You know, if the happy part doesn't blow up, we do dot write and you build an either with the write. Or if you have um, errors, well, you try catch everything and according to the, the branch, you return something that is more meaningful in your domain, like, you know, no internet, do something, or show a dialogue or something. And the convention is that the, you have the wrong um, object, the wrong on the left, and the right on the right, because, you know, creative people. Um, and this is, this is basically either. For the people that are more advanced in this kind of stuff, I'm keeping it simple so there is no mention about network or that other stuff. Let's assume that everything is blocking, everything is uh, pretty straightforward. My point is that now we have a new tool to give you back, well, return more than one single thing from a, from a function. And we are happy, and it's Monday again. I mean, these people don't sleep. Uh, they want to contact the user by phone number. Same, same thing all over again. We have a string, but we are better than that. We are better people, so we, we create a, a phone number object because we want to validate, you know? We have another function that validates if it's actually um, a valid number, if it's uh, an international uh, prefix or something. And, okay, we are happy. Still, new Monday, new stuff. This, uh, okay, left postal address. Okay, I mean, who does that? And then you realize, oh, my bank does that because they want to send you stuff like, you know, your verification pin. So they also need the, the postal address. The... the, the the DTO is getting a bit um, large. Even if we put a lot of validation and verification, the thing, I mean, you can read it, but I'm, be I'm betting that Uncle Bob is not impressed because every time we are changing the, the type, user profile is just keep changing, okay? And everything that we need, everything goes into the, the user profile. We have a domain model Problem, domain modeling problem. And you just sit, you talk to the people in your team and you realize that, well, these are actually a uh, way to contact the user, okay? They are just contact information. And the fact that we are adding them sounds like, well, it's a list, okay? How about we put a list there? And this is, this is how you do it, okay? You actually improve on the, on the model where, as you go. And you build a sealed class, you have an email, you have a phone, you have a postal address, and you replace everything with a list in the user profile. So even if you want to add something new, the user profile type, it won't change because the, you decoupled the contact information way, the contact ways uh, from the, the first name and the last name. And you were right, because another morn Monday, and these people, they are like, okay, let's go green, so we are actually starting to send pigeons. Okay, so I don't know how you can validate the pigeon kind of thing, but still, we have a new pigeon uh, type in our domain, and the user profile is still there. This is, this is cool, okay? So we, we now we have a, a, a good way to model the contact information list. And the um, problem is that uh, one of the business requirements is we need at least one contact info. Okay? I don't care if it's phone, I don't care if it's uh, <laughs> pigeon. Uh, the business requires at least one way to uh, contact the user. It can, the list cannot be empty. First thing you do, start checking is not empty everywhere okay th th this is the this is the way you do it until you realize that this thing is everywhere and now everybody has to remember that the list cannot be empty so every time you want to send a contact address you have to check you know 
that the list is not empty because well when you created the the user somehow you put an address there or a phone but we are paranoid people okay so this thing is going to be basically everywhere it's not empty all over the place until you start thinking about what if we build a list that it's not empty okay it contains at least one element and because we are creative people we look at the library and there is a known empty list wow yeah non empty list because of the um, impossible guessing from the name i'm going to explain you contains at least one element okay you get it this is serious stuff okay so that's the thing okay you have constructor like non empty list of and you have to put something in it so we moved the business requirement from a meeting and then it went to slack and then it became a jira ticket and before it reached confluence that's where documentation goes to die because nobody ever checks confluence i mean if you don't want people to find stuff just write it on confluence it's like google search second page okay nobody looks there and but now we have it in the code. There is literally no way that you can build a user profile with no way to contact the user. And so this is just a, like a top of the iceberg when it comes to types that we can uh, leverage from uh, Arrow and other functional programming um, languages. You have things like try is basically the functional programming way of throwing exception because they don't like throwing ex exception. I mean, we, we shouldn't be throwing exception because they don't they don't represent reality. Okay, they don't model reality because if you go to the bakery, okay, and you ask for bread, and there is no bread, the person that runs the bakery it says there is no bread. Come tomorrow come back later okay like come back in the afternoon it's called exponential back off okay you just ch check again in the afternoon when you start throwing exception is basically you go to the backer you ask for bread and the person behind the counter they just blow themselves they just they shoot themselves in the head okay this is not how life works and as computer scientists we should do better than life you know okay so we if you have something that can blow up, you wrap it in a try, and now your function return, returns a try of whatever, and you know that, well, you are trying to modeling a success or a failure scenario. And try as option, as either, has the same method, it has map, has fold, so you can actually just um, use the successful path you just do you know dot map and you know that it's only successful in there you don't care about the, the explosion you don't care about what uh, what went wrong you just want the happy part and this is this is how you do it no passing around a ticking bomb to the next developer i don't know what to do with this thing enjoy you know and everybody and everybody is actually hoping that the next person is catching the thing until it reaches the the main thread or the, whatever the virtual machine now i mean you have smart people probably they know uh and everything blows up and in my case well that's serious stuff because people you know are just looking for the soulmate or they're navigating so if, if the app crashes that's bad okay i mean what if you are scrolling instagram cats and kind of you know makeup and that kind of stuff it's, you don't need to crash uh this is how you do you basically play it safe okay when you start thinking what happens when things go wrong when you take responsibility for the the failure of your code because that happens i mean we are we are humans uh, this is just one example validated um you have a um, registration form where you have you know mandatory fields and you validate every field with a different regular expression or you know fancy stuff that you copy based from this is something that helps you because this is actually 
one type that can give you the whole collection of errors in your uh, form. Okay, you saw the, the, the name went red, and then you have an error message. Uh, the, the last name went red. Validated something like that. Helps you in that kind of scenario. You know, massive validation, like form validation. State, if you have a state machine, you can build a state machine in a functional way. IO is basically when you do IO stuff. So we skipped over this because in Arrow, they are rewriting a lot of stuff. I wanted to keep it simple. So, but if you are reading from network, if you are reading from a database, this is, this is how you model it. So when I'm telling you IO or user profile, you know that the stuff is coming from somewhere. So you, you are running it on a separate thread, or you need to be aware that this thing is not blocking. So it gives you information in the signature. You read the signature, and yes, it's different from the bare minimum stuff, return void or whatever, but I don't need to check at the, the documentation. And I, and I don't need to check the source code. I don't need to bother the other developer how this thing is working, okay? You have a lot of information in the signature. And when you start thinking about this, it becomes um, a, a habit. It's a, like a team habit, a team culture thing that, that goes beyond just the, the nerds, let's be honest, because the moment you start building a shared language, the domain modeling, uh, domain-driven design people call it ubiquitous language because they like to scare people, like you know the functional programming people. So you build a shared language because if I, I need to have a conversation with the marketing people, and I'm telling them, you know, we need a verified email to send a survey, they will get it. They will all. They actually will get. Uh, also, we want an email and we need to be sure that the is verified Boolean is true. Probably they get it as well. But is it really necessary? How about you just you play in English, okay? And you call things for what they are. You build a more deterministic code base because there are fewer side effects or unexpected stuff like, you know, you don't have a, in Kotlin, especially when we work with um, Java Kotlin uh, code bases, you don't have checked expression, uh, exceptions. So basically, uh, IntelliJ doesn't give you any information. You run the thing, you, you hope that everything is okay, that you know doesn't blow up. Most of the Android stuff blows up, so you need to check the documentation. And if you start thinking about, okay, this thing will blow up because, well, it's a try, okay? You trust the other person that they build the SDK, they build the AVI, and they, they know that a try represents something that can fail, and you know it as well. So everything is kind of better. Still, it's a difficult world, it's a creative job, but it gets better. And business requirements from Jira to the code, because that's where the stuff has to be, because there, the tests are in the code. You don't run your test suite against Jira, okay? The QA people, they want to check if the stuff is working. Even if it's, it's on Jira, it doesn't mean anything. And it doesn't mean that actually I, I build it accordingly. So at that point, what, build it and put the requirements in the code. Enforce the type system because we are, we are working with you know, Java, Scala, Kotlin, the, the compiler can help you. And if you keep it simple and, and you don't try, like, like Chris said, you don't try to be smarter than the compiler, you know, it helps you a lot. And, and basically builds a, um, a mindset where you think about what can go wrong. You take responsibility for, well, this thing is a IO or something. So it means that runs on the network so it will take time, so we need a progress bar. And it's an uh, internet, you know, the internet is kind of shitty somewhere, somewhere, a lot in Berlin, it's, it's awful in the underground. So what happens if there is no internet? So we should show a dialogue, we should show an error message. You start thinking in a more uh, holistic way about, even just, uh, oh yeah, just ask something to the backend is coming in, uh, 
in a millisecond because I'm running on Wi-Fi in the office, everything is fine. But again, you start building this mindset of shit happens, seriously. And if you want to read about this, there is, this is a, a nice book. Uh, don't, don't get, I don't put the title because the title is kind of meh for a lot of people in my world because the, they are using half sharp. Okay, so no Java, no Scala. F sharp is cool. The guy uh, is working with F sharp, but the the, um, the information that he presents, the the knowledge that he shares, are basically familiar concepts for a lot of languages, and it talks a lot. It does a lot of um, examples from a real world domain. Super boring, like a delivery, shopping, whatever they 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 do logistics. So it, I don't think it gets more boring than that. But that's the perfect scenario for domain modeling because, well, you are just taking paper and replacing it with a form, and then you start talking to the people and like, you know, what if the order number is empty? It cannot be empty. So you know, it's not not. What, what's an order ID? It's like a number. Okay, do we do mathematic operation with it? No. Can it be a string? Yeah, who cares? Yes, can be a, and then you, and you build better types, you know, for the, and you validate forms. And you have a, a very, 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 um, like real world example journey through the book that is a bit like what, what we did here. And I, Pretty sure that you have a lot of experience with this weird scenario where you were thinking that well they in, will never be empty, and then in the end it was empty even if you had like four thousand unit tests that were checking if it, because it was empty at runtime. So good luck with that. And um, this is I hope you enjoyed. This is the the yeah first part of the talk. Now we have questions. If you have any, if you have comments, please refrain. Uh, <laughs> uh, only, only nice things. Um, and I, I thank you, I thank you, and I wish the rest of the conference uh, have a nice afternoon. <laughs> Question, please. Nice please. Also, also nice comment. <laughs> uh, very fun talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. How much do you think sometimes if you make the wrong safety assumptions at the start, you can doom your software infrastructure to not be able to accommodate real-world scenarios? So the first thing, the simplest possible class, the example, what do you do when people don't have a last name? Because some people don't. But that's a Or when people don't have um, a street number or even a postcode because they live in, you know, some town in some strange part of, you know, maritime Canada where no postcodes because who needs that, right? The How do you, now you've got a system, where do you fit that in? Thank you for the question. And actually, uh, this is a, a real thing that we, we experienced in my company because we were wondering if the last name has to be mandatory because I mean, what if Beyonce wants to register? Okay, what, 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 what then what? You don't get Beyonce on board because she doesn't have a last name. Or oh, Madonna? Will you, will you, just say Madonna? Please don't. Uh, but that's a more. It's a domain question, and that's the the beauty of it because you build the the model on the domain. So if it's mandatory, because well, we expect we only want, for instance. Uh, Imagine that in the user profile you have age, okay? And you want to model it with an int, okay? And then you start to see age, age two. And you're like, okay, this is not good. And then you start thinking about it and then say, okay, but we are kind of Tinder, so people need to be at least 18. So age has to be 18. That's a business kind of requirement. It's a domain um, requirement. So you enforce the type uh, constrained after you actually figure out how the domain has to work. So if your scenario is, you know what, I come from Canada, 
this thing won't work for Canada users, and then the business say, well, you know, we are just working in Germany because we are S-Bahn Berlin. So, well, you know, the, the thing doesn't apply to your domain. And plus, it's not carved in stone, and, oh, ah, yeah, I don't have a screen, sh a screen sh uh, saver anymore. The person doesn't, yeah, you know, Mac OS broke the screen saver. Yeah, cope with me. Um, but again, that's a, a domain question, and that's legit. And uh, probably you will actually change, like I changed the user profile when they started to add two millions uh, way to contact the users, okay? And you evolve. You take, the, you take your chance, you postpone as much as possible. I mean, Uncle Bob always say, yeah, today is the worst day to take a decision because you will never have so little information as today. So if you can postpone, postpone it. Thank you. Any other question? Are we good? Enjoy your afternoon, everybody. <laughs>